Our text for today, um, it's the last part of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Let me read that and then we'll pray once again. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believer's example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given to you by prophecy, which a council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourselves and on your teaching. Persist in these, in this, for by doing so you save both yourself and your hearers. Well, let's pray. Lord, again, once, we, once again, we thank you for your word. I pray that you be with us, encourage us as we look to your word today. Amen. Well, if you notice this morning, things on the stage look a little bit different. We're trying to get some more lighting here. And so please feel free to give me feedback. Uh, or we can give Richard feedback on, on different things. If it's helpful to see us, if you'd rather not see me, then tell Nathan back there he can dim me down. Um, and I'll be in the shadows once again. But, but we appreciate the opportunity we have with some more lighting here. We've been going through 1 Timothy. And I hope you've been enjoying the journey through that. We've got two more chapters to go after today. Um, we'll take about four weeks, if you remember rightly, to get through these final couple chapters. We've seen that a deep in life with God comes from having accurate beliefs, that sound doctrine, good spiritual practices, and authentic Christian community. The Christian community that was needed there in Ephesus was one of the things that we see Paul encouraging Timothy around. And as I tried to outline the sermons and the things that we were going to look at, originally my plan was to incorporate these final couple verses back into the first part of chapter 4. But as I looked at them, I realized, no, there's some important things here that would be good for us to look at in a separate message. And we find that the counsel that we see here is somewhat timeless, even though they are more specifically given to Timothy. As I read these verses, I realized that these could be a job description, if you would, a job description for Timothy as he serves in the church of Ephesus. And so if you'll let me, let me rephrase these things with the next slide, Diana. A job description for Timothy. If you can't read it, you can ask me later. But it says, urban church facing trials due to false teachers is seeking a pastor. Applicants are to be able to instruct others in sound doctrine and godliness. Be a model of godly, godliness in speech and conduct. Have a personal devotion for the word of God. Exhibit spiritual gifts in teaching and leadership. Wholeheartedly guard both your doctrine and how you live. This is a job description we can pull from these verses here that we see. And if you've ever had a job, you know the value of a good job description. It not only tells you what is expected, but hopefully empowers, equips you to do your job well. Now, all this came to mind as I reflected back about a year ago or so when we began to look for a job description for the role that we've called Eli to fulfill. It's helpful for that because our expectations for that role, that position, was more than just be a preacher. We didn't say, Eli, just come here and be a preacher. Well, there's much more in giving leadership in the church than standing up on a Sunday morning. And like Paul's instructions to Timothy here at Ephesus, we had our own needs and objectives in mind. Now, we didn't explicitly include the things that we see Paul talking about here, but, but we included statements that were specific to our culture, our needs, our desires. And so here are a few of them that we have. Spend extended time, that is, was to include Sunday morning, Sunday school, perhaps a midweek service. Spend extended time in other EFCA churches in Utah to learn what they do, why they do it, and to build relationships with them. A second objective was to meet with the pastors and church leaders serving in the churches here in Cache Valley for the same goal to learn what they do, why they do it, and to build relationships with them. 
One of the other things we mentioned was to begin the ordination process. Ordination is, is this going through, writing papers, being quizzed, if you would, on some of the things. And I'll explain why that's important here in a second. But all of these together, our objective was to equip Eli in the role of assuming a lead pastor role in our church. From the context of our community, Built into it, I hope you see some objectives that both offer a methodology for us or for him to know our desires, as well as some direction of how we want him to grow as he prepares to assume that role of leadership in our church. Our identity, as Eli told us at the very beginning here, is found in our mission statement. Our mission statement of building relationships united in Christ to reach our community for God's glory. Both our job descriptions are in our job description reflects both our mission statement and what we value. You see, what we value is an important thing. It's important for you as a church to know what is it that we value. One of the brochures that we have there kind of use a play on our church's name, Cash Valley Bible Fellowship. We seek to reach Cash Valley. We value the Bible and we seek to be a fellowship of believers here together. The job description reflects these things. We want the lead pastor to not only preach a biblical message, but to be an example of building relationships within our church, but also within the community here in which we live and have the value, the desire to take the good news of Christ into our community. The goal of that ordination part is to provide both him and the church some accountability. The ordination process allows the individual who's going through it to express their beliefs in this sound doctrine that we've talked about. So I wanted to consider this morning those five points that I pulled out of 1 Timothy chapter 4 here is kind of in our outline for our study today. Let me read them one more time. To be able to instruct others on sound doctrine and godliness, from verse 11. From verse 12, be a model of godliness in speech and conduct. Verse 13, personal devotion to the word of God. Verse 14, exhibit spiritual gifts in teaching and leadership. And the final two verses, wholeheartedly guard both your doctrine and how you live. Well, the first one here, able to teach others on sound doctrine and godliness. We see this reflected in verse 11. Teach these things and insist on, I'm sorry, teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. Now, I began by reading this from the ESV translation. Your translation may, if you're following along, may use the word command there. But I, I like the way the NLT here uses the word insist. I think insist captures more of the emotion of what Paul is thinking about. It's a relational word where command is more of an order. Now I could pick on, where, where did Caleb go? Caleb's here somewhere. Uh, I could pick on Caleb. There you are, Caleb. I, there's no one, no one else here that's around 16 or 17. But, but if mom and dad said, Caleb, we're commanding you to learn to drive, it'd be different than, Caleb, you know, you should, you should learn to drive. It'd be good. You know, this insisting verse, a command. Insist, like I said, is more of a relational word. It's still the same result. The goal is to have this completion here. But Paul is telling Timothy that he's to teach these things, insist that everyone learn them. He's communicating the need for Timothy, as we'll see in a lot of these points here this morning, a need for Timothy to be more direct his need to take charge, his need to insist, to teach. See, T Timothy is also to teach with a sense of urgency. This isn't something that's neither here nor there. This is important. Insist on it. Command it. He's to instruct those within the church with a sound doctrine on the one hand and to correct the false teachers and their disciples on the other 
how we do this, though, sometimes in the church is, is a, a little bit of a challenge. In fact, to explain that challenge, we oftentimes speak of two categories, if you will, of biblical doctrine, of biblical thought. We see that we have primary and secondary doctrines. Now, maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't, but sometimes we don't always agree on certain things. And a simple explanation of what they are is that the primary doctrines are the doctrines that are required for salvation. That these are the core beliefs of the Christian church. The secondary doctrines are important nonetheless, but but they are not important unto salvation. What what do I mean by these primary doctrines? Well, I'm just going to give you a few of them. Again, if you're attending Eli's class, you've been looking at those primary doctrines. I heard today that you talked about the Holy Spirit. Having a biblical, clear understanding of those things is important. But those would include things like the Trinity, salvation by faith alone, Christ's substitutionary atonement, the virgin birth, the sinlessness of Christ, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. The future bodily resurrection of the believer as well. Anyone who denies one of these would be standing outside of the orthodox beliefs of the Christian church. It's important for us to understand those. Defining the secondary issues and their importance is also helpful. A book by Norm Geisler, he writes in his book, The Christian Ethics, he offers a long list of secondary issues. Issues that are important, and it's a good book if you want more of an academic understanding of those things. But for the church today, we have things we believe in, from baptism to communion, views on eschatology to charismatic gifts to church governance. All of these are important matters in the church, but they are secondary issues. In other words, you have one view, I have another. These aren't things that we divide over as we mind of who Christ is. Because we as a church see these things as not being as important, if we were to pull different people in the church today, you would find different views on some of those secondary issues. It's what makes us a community of believers. We love each other, as Eli encouraged us in the opening. We care for each other. But these essentials, these primary doctrines... We teach and insist on all to learn them. The second point was to be a model of godliness in speech and conduct. We see this in verse 12. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Now the takeaway from this verse is that if you're under 40, this is good news. You're still young. You may not feel young. I hear some complaints from some of you in your 30s that you're feeling old. But but Timothy, we don't know, but we believe that he was probably in his mid-30s when Paul wrote to him. He was seen as a young man. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. The inference of the text would indicate that Timothy was facing opposition to his authority due to his youth. And so Paul was writing to him to encourage him to not be dissuaded. I wonder if you have felt others looking down upon you, doubting your ability because of your age or gender or something else. Paul to the church in Corinth wrote these words that I think are helpful. Now it is required that those who have... To, I'm sorry. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust, must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by a human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. It's this idea of the Lord who judges me gives me the freedom to to pursue what God is calling us to. Knowing that the Lord judges me, allows me, frees me up to faithfully serve in spite of others' judgments of me. Timothy's character, not his 
age, Paul is telling him, his character, his calling determined his authority to give leadership. So what does Paul instruct Timothy in? Well, he says this, set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Timothy is to be an example in these things. It's not a long list, but just real briefly, we see some things that are important to be that example. First, in speech, Paul told Timothy previously to speak with a gentle authority. We saw earlier that he was to avoid useless or argumentative debates. We also see that he is to give leadership in his life. He's to represent Christ in every way as he lives his life. If our actions, now if our actions contradict our words, the truth of what we are saying is going to be drowned out by our actions, is it not? We saw previously that's where the word hypocrite comes from. We're also to lead in love. If, if I say the right words, right? If I say the right words and live the right way, but lack love. Well, 1 Corinthians 13 tells me I'm a resounding gong. It's useless. It reveals, if nothing else, a legalistic view of what God expects of me. If I can make my words and actions devoid of that love, well, with the message that then I'm preaching is one that suggests that God loves me if. It's also give leadership in faith. Our faith gives definition to our speech, our life, our love. Our faith and hope in Christ make it clear, make it clear that it is God who gets the glory in all things and not us. The last word in his list here is purity. It's a rarely used ver uh, word that means that we use for virtue or chastity. But here the word implies integrity and consistency, and reinforces the whole list that we have seen. And like with other lists that we find in Scripture, they're not intended to be complete. It doesn't include everything. But it just gives us a glimpse into the life that Timothy was to live to be an example. And what's important in this list is how they are linked together. You see, individually they're important, none, no doubt, but it's how they're linked together that is critically important. Our speech is important, but must be linked with our life. And combining it with the right words and actions. And this combination of outward qualities and inward qualities of love and faith and purity sums up what Paul wants Timothy to be thinking about. The third point that we see there in verse 13 is that he is to devote himself, or we are to devote ourselves to the word of God. It's an interesting way that we see this in verse 13. It says, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. These three things are a list of public activities that Timothy was to be engaged in. They're things that we commonly see in our Sunday morning worship time. We see the public reading of Scripture with the intent of instruction or encouragement to the church. It's thinking back and recognizing the value and importance of the public reading of Scripture in the synagogue. And he's saying, just as it is important there, so too it is to be or have a prominent place in the church there in Ephesus. The word here for exhortation, we sometimes see it to be expressed in preaching or the expositing of the word that is read. The public testimony to teach and to preach about it as well. The devotion is a teaching, the passing on this sound doctrine that the letter has been about. And all three of these are important to the pastor of the church. It's especially important in a church that is in need of correction. See, the correction that 
Timothy is to bring isn't just simply to be, well, I don't like that that you're talking about. It's to take them back to the Word. And in our church today, we see these elements played out in our Sunday services as well. The reading of Scripture is interwoven throughout our service. It's seen everything from our call to worship to the preaching. If you notice, we you may not come from a tradition that does this, but in our church tradition here, we have a call to worship that is oftentimes seen in either a scripture reading, like we did this morning, or a responsive reading, where you'll where we will together read scripture. It's intentional. It's to allow us to focus our hearts and minds on why it is that we are here, of why we are gathered together. And it's for that reason that it's good for you to be here at the beginning of the service. To not linger somewhere, but to be present to hear the scripture read to Prepare our hearts. See, it's not a prelude, but it's done to prepare our hearts to hear the exhortation, the teaching that will come. Devote yourselves to the Word of God. The fourth point that we find here in the text is to exhibit the spiritual gift of teaching and leadership. This is, again, is seen in verse 14. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given to you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. I try to think of an example where I would say to you, do not neglect something. Uh, But in my failure to kind of think of a good example, I think we all understand what it means. To tell someone to not neglect a gift reminds them of the gift that they have and encourages them to put it into practice, to use it. And because of what Paul mentions, it's possible that Timothy's image of himself as a minister was lacking. And the encouragement here is to remind him to put to use what God has given him, of the calling that he has, of his need to use it to serve the church. I appreciate what Paul says in 2 Timothy in chapter 1. This is what he says there, verses 6 and 7. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. What's interesting in both of these lists, we find a similar message. Timothy's calling came through a prophetic message that was received. It was confirmed on him by the laying on of hands from the elders and from Paul. And Paul here in this verse is instructing him to fan into flames the spiritual gift that he has received. And what's interesting in both of these verses, in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy and chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, the word gift is singular. It's not a plural. It's not use all the gifts that you have been given. It's use this gift. The singular gift, the call to ministry that God has given him. The call that has been confirmed on him through prophecy from God, confirmed on the church through the laying on of hands. Some of these words, like the laying on of hands, may be a very familiar thing to you or may be a bit unfamiliar. We as a church practice this in a variety of ways. For example, when someone is called into service, sometimes when we have those that are going out to work on the mission field and they're leaving us and we're sending them out, we'll surround them and pray for them and lay hands upon them. When someone is commissioned to ministry, will lay hands on them. When someone is in need for healing, will lay hands on them and pray for them or for a blessing. You see, the laying on of hands is a physical reminder, a physical reminder of God's promises to us, of his indwelling of us, in us, equipping of us, and the family nature that we have. 
We need those kinds of things. We need the physical touch of a reminder that God is with us. Laying on of hands is one of the ways in which we've done that. The fifth thing that we see here in the final two verses is wholeheartedly guard both your doctrine and how you live. Listen to those verses. Give your complete attention to these matters. Throw yourself into your task so that everyone will see your progress. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the sake of those who hear you. Again, I like the way that this translation words these things. Of how Paul suggests that Timothy is to guard himself in the calling of the ministry that he has. Once again, the New Living uses the word diligent that your translation may have to say, give your complete attention to. Focus on. Give all your attention to this. It draws our attention to the value and importance of persistency. It echoes the idea that we saw previously to the athletic training. Remember we saw that last time? That we need that. We need to push through things. The Christian minister, as he serves in the public, must realize that what he does not only reflects on himself and the congregation, but the Christian faith at large and the Lord who has called him. Not only is he to give his full attention to these things, but he's to do it with abandonment. To do it with abandonment. To throw yourself into these tasks so that everyone may see your task. Throw yourself into the job. We know that expression. To give it all that you got. You see, the pastor's public display of faith gives credibility to the message that he preaches. But it's also true for the church. This past week in the, in the pastor cluster that I lead, I came across an article by Ray Ortland, And he, in his article, is reflecting on 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And there he says this for the church. A church validates and embodies God's truth in the world. The beauty of community in a church is meant to be a plausibility structure for the gospel, lifting its social visibility as a pillar, reinforcing its persuasive power as a buttress. A church makes the gospel known and even compelling, and it will not be a captive voice for the truth if it is not living as a beautiful family. Read that last one again. And it will not be a captive voice for the truth if it is not living as a beautiful family. You see, the way we live together is a testimony to the world around us. It's not just something we should do, but we must do to be a witness into our community. It's just not the word that is preached that is compelling, but it's the way the church lives. You see, the words of Jesus is remember back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. If we as a church do not love as he is loved, it all means nothing. Therefore, as Paul again says in verse 16, the first part of the verse, keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Paul is not necessarily encouraging the self-examination, but a constant alertness. Be aware of how you're living out, both in your life and your doctrine. These two things have to go together. We can't separate life from doctrine. For right doctrine without godly life has no value. And a godly life without right doctrine is not possible. Timothy and the church leaders were unlikely to have a positive influence on their community if they didn't live in this way. Finally, Timothy's wholeheartedness in guarding his doctrine is seen 
in the last part of verse 16. Paul's final challenge here, stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear. Stay true, persist, persevere in them. We understand the image, don't we? Again, going back to our athletic trainer, if any of you have had anybody work with you, they say, keep pushing through it. Don't ease up. Now, you may not believe it, but they will tell you at times that the struggle you're facing is more mental than physical. And you may say, well, I don't know about that. It feels pretty physical to me. And we do that and find it easier to yield to the pressures around us rather than to persevere. Paul is calling Timothy and us to persevere. Keep our eyes on him. Push through whatever it is that we find ourselves struggling with. Be on our guard. The church leader perseveres not only for his sake, but for the sake of the congregation, the salvation of those who hear. We must understand. The leadership of the church must understand the critical importance of both right doctrine and sound living. The wrong beliefs can quickly lead us into sin and into heresy. We see it around us all the time. We must be on our guard against those that persuade us that how you live is what's important. Well, as I said, we already saw that. The problem of heresy and being a hypocrite. Yes, how we live is important, but having that sound doctrine is as important as well. We're to persevere. Be on our guard. Timothy is hearing these words from Paul to encourage him to persevere. As he perseveres, the questions about his age and other things will be answered. Paul began the chapter by pointing out that the Spirit predicted the sun would fall away into error. And for like false teachers today, they oftentimes said, well, we have the truth, we have the right way to live. But in doing so, they've renounced the faith and pursued a godlessness of self-righteousness. Timothy is to correct such thinking. He's to correct those who have gone astray to provide a clear and right example of what is true. So I want to circle back for just a moment. I want us to think once again about this job description that Paul is giving him. A job description that is clear in its reasoning for Paul or for Timothy's training. And the goal of, for both him and the church is to be fit for God's work, the work that God has called him to, the work that he's been ordained to complete. You see, if we're unclear about where we're to go, then we're not going to push through. Those disciplines that help us get us there will fall short. And we'll find ourselves not only discouraged, but susceptible to the false prophets that Paul is warning about. We're to stay strong by searching God's word for the answers and by gathering here with others. I've just recently spoken to a young woman who was struggling with certain things, and the only thing I could tell her was that not only, well, her struggle is she felt kept falling back into ways in which she wanted to be set free from. And part of the problem was her lack of Christian community. If I don't surround myself with those who encourage me in God's word, then I'll find myself susceptible to those things that distract me. What else do we find here? You see, we as a church here look forward to what God has for us. We look forward to seeing what He will bring to us. 
as we look forward to these transitions that will come in the months ahead, we look forward to the positive steps that God will bring to us as a church. Positive growth steps. Nothing new, if you will, because it's a continuation of the work that God has been doing amongst us. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking that our church in, what, two years? In September, two years from now, will be 60 years old. For 60 years, a church has sought to bring this message to our community. There's been different faces that has led us, but each step, hopefully, is a growing step, an encouraging step, something we anticipate, something we look forward to. What doesn't change is the message that is preached. Our theme verse, I couldn't tell you when we started with this theme verse, but I've read it a few times this last little bit. No matter who is leading from up front, we're still Christ's church. And the leadership is still your servants, as this verse says. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus is Lord, and ourselves as your servants. If there's a day when someone preaches something different, then we'll cease to be Christ's church, won't we? But those up front are to be your servants for Jesus' sake and preach Christ as Lord. And it's just not the leaders who do that. It's to be ourselves. As you, I encourage you to go out and spend some time talking with one another to encourage one another to be one another's servants. As we prepare as a church for this transition in, in the months ahead, I challenge you to come to it full of hope and anticipation. Not just in something new, but to see what God will do. What God has for us in the future. That God will use those times to accomplish His purposes for His glory. And in those things we can then rejoice. Well, let me pray for us. Lord, I pray this morning that as we look forward to seeing what you do with us as a church, that we rejoice in what you are doing in our lives as well. Remind us of these things, Lord. Remind us of what you have done, what you promised to do, to fill us with hope and encouragement, Lord. We give you thanks. Amen.